So today's video is a Q&A that I said I'd do as I've now reached 1,000 subscribers and I'd like to thank each and every one of you for subscribing. So, <clears throat> Alexander, thank you very much mate. Anthony, nice one. Andrew, thank you very much. Aaron, brilliant mate. Sir Watch Geek! Sir Watch Geek! Sir Watch Geek! Sir Watch Geek! And finally, Zachariah. Thank you very much indeed. Well, hello fellow watch fans and welcome to my first and probably my last Q&A that absolutely no one has been waiting for. If it wasn't for a few jolly decent people who obviously took great pity on me and answered my call for questions on my YouTube community tab, you'd all be spared the next 30 minutes or so. So, it's chocks away. Here's the Q&A. Quick wrist check first. Today I am wearing my Steel Dive 6105 Captain Willard homage. Not worn a lot, and we'll touch on that reason a little bit later. So the first question comes from D Underhay. Out of the watches you have owned, which is your favourite and why? Well, D Underhay. Dave? Derek? Daniel? Dom? Dimitri! If your name isn't Dimitri under hay. Well, it should be. I'm sorry about that, mate. I'm off on one already. So, interesting question. Let me throw this back to you. Can anyone name their absolute favourite song of all time? Now, I have a whole bunch that take me back to various stages in my life and hold such meaning as I'm sure you all do too. So trying to pick a favourite watch and uh, as I now have 30 watches uh, mostly obtained in the last two years, my favourite changes almost daily. But it was the Breitling Navitimer that really started it all off for me. I remember reading one of the uh, lad mags back in the day. FHM, I think, in about 95, and there it was, a full-page advert for the Navitimer. And I thought there and then, one day, I'm going to have one of those. And uh, it was about seven years later that I was fortunate to realise my dream, although I still wasn't into watches. And uh, a couple of years later, for reasons I still don't know why, I sold that and bought my first Navi World. Now that had to go about three or four years later, needed the money, and it wasn't until 2019, some 10 years later, that I was in a very fortunate position to replace that, and only then it started to become massively into watches. And soon after that, I bought my B01 46mm, and that has to be the all-time favourite watch of all time, mate. All right, not off. Thank you very much for that. And uh, the second question is from Steve Fox. What are your three favourite brands at below £400, 400 to £1,000, pounds, and luxury, and why? And time for another watch. Sir asked, which do you consider the best value for money watch and why? Now, this is interesting as well. Now, from my experience of what I own, then in the below £400 bracket, I'd have to say that Orient is a particular standout for me. The Orient Triton at £295 is a belter of a watch. Now, apart from the rather tinny bracelet, which I can just about forgive it for, you get a certified 200 metre diver, 43.5 mil diameter, 
Orion's own in-house caliber 40N 5A movement with 40 hour power reserve and a power reserve meter. Now the build quality of the watch is excellent and it feels really high quality. And if I were to buy another Orient, it would be the red Kamasu. Not seemingly widely available, but I've found them for about £210 on Tinternet. Uh, and I'm sure that would be another corker of a watch. £400 to £1,000. Easy one for me. That has to be Satina. My DSPH200M reissue of their 1967 original cost £464 and is just beautiful and my DS Action Diver costing around £700 but you can get it cheaper if you shop around has to be the watch that punches well above its weight. Build quality superb, wears extremely well for a 43mm watch, Powermatic 80 movement which is exclusive to the Swatch Group and is based on the ETA 2824-2 with 80 hours power reserve. And it is the piece that gets the most wrist time from my collection. In terms of luxury, well, it's brightling all the way for me. Even though I'm very fortunate to have two Rolex, Rolex, Rolexes, plural of Ro Roli, two Roli, Breitling uh, quality is just, in my opinion, just something else. Absolutely gorgeous watches. Thank you very much for those questions, guys. The next one, oh, we're battling along, is from the Captain Toad. The Captain Toad. I love that name. Arr, me hearties. I be Captain Toad of Toadville. Why do you like collecting watches? What about them appeals to you? Well, I don't know why, but us humans are very strange in that we collect almost anything. Coins, stamps, medals. Some people collect beer mats. Some collect crisp packets. That's potato chips. Even toothpaste tubes. Are they any more insane than us watch collectors? Probably, yeah. Toothpaste tubes? Weird. For me, though, as an ex-mechanical design engineer in the automotive industry, I just love the mechanical complexity in watch movements and the beautiful overall design. They're, they're small and intricate and just gorgeous to look at and wear. And there are thousands of different makes and models and designs which always make us want to go out and buy another. Ooh. And um, oh, the Captain Toad's next question, which is a belter, <clears throat> is cereal soup? Well, now as soon as you start to type this into Google, it autofills. And yes, there is a lot of discussion and debate on this one. Now, soup, why are we doing this? Soup is strictly defined as a liquid food made by boiling or simmering meat, fish or vegetables with various added ingredients. But I hear you cry, what about gazpacho? That's a cold soup. And there are sweet soups that are never boiled, like Vietnamese che thai that is considered a dessert soup. Now, I spent far too long looking into this, but I think the, the conclusion is, is that the ultimate definition is whatever you want it to be. So for me, from now on, I consider my nice bowl of evening crunching at cornflakes to be a bowl of soup. Thanks, Captain Toad. Brilliant questions. Uh, the next question is from the good friend John Moran. Hi, John. Another belter of a question. Cheese on toast with Worcestershire sauce or Henderson's relish? Now, firstly, for my American friends, it's Worcestershire and not Worcestershire or Worcestershire. We have weird names. That's quite an easy one compared to some of our place names. 
Well, John, I didn't know what Henderson's relish was until now. Apparently, it's like Worcestershire sauce, but without the anchovies. But in any case, I'm afraid to say I'm a cheese on toast with lashings of tomato ketchup, man. Sorry about that. Um, and, and John's second question, and more seriously, what would you consider the perfect daily knockabout watch to be? Mine is a battered Swatch System 51. Very nice indeed, John. Well, by knockabout, if you mean DIYing or uh, washing the car or hoovering the garden, etc., I, I never wear a watch for those. I'm too scared to even wear my cheapest, as I know I'll end up knocking it. But I have considered getting the Casio F91W for those very purposes. And currently, at just under a tenner from Amazon, I don't think you can go wrong with that. But thank you very much for those, John. Now, the next question is from fellow, my good friend Raphael from Florida. Here's a contentious one. Rolex or Amiga, which do you prefer and why? Well, in terms of which is the better brand, if you're a Rolex fan, you'll find reasons to justify why Rolex are better. And if you're an Amiga fan, you'll find reasons to justify why Amiga are better. But in terms of which do I prefer, I honestly don't favour one over the other. Uh, now, Rolex, by way of controlling availability, have very much made their watches arguably more desirable. But Amiga are massively up there as well in terms of desirability. But with Amiga, you can actually walk into an AD and buy one. So... Uh, I'm sorry if that's a bit of a cop out there, Raf, but it, it, it sort of leads me into your next question, which is what is your criteria slash methodology for evaluating and deciding to purchase a watch? Well, I've thought about this um, a lot and I think I've sort of derived a, um, um, reasons. First and foremost, it's budget. How much money do I have available to me at that inevitable time I have a Jonesen to buy a new watch? Now, there are very few lucky SOBs out there who have a constant, unlimited amount of spondulis to buy whatever they want, whenever they want. And that's why I think I have such a varied collection. I'm not always disciplined enough to save up. I'm very impatient. So once I know how much pocket money Mrs. Watch Geek is going to give me, the next thing is to visit my ever-expanding wish list, which I'm sure we all have. And that is pretty much determined from looks for me, scrolling endlessly through Instagram, watching YouTube videos galore. We all spot the watches that we like the look of, and that is subjective to every one of us. And that applies to almost, almost anything we buy, really, except food. Food is food. But cars, clothes, art, watches, we all have different tastes. So when I've spotted watches that I like and I have a budget, the very next is to look at the spec. Now, it's like seeing a beautiful new car for sale at 30k and finding out it's only got a one litre engine. Can you live with that? Do the looks of the car outweigh the small engine size? Weird analogies. What am I doing? I don't know. Now, there are lots of micro brands out there that are four to five hundred pounds that sport an NH35 movement, for example. Now, is that enough to float your boat? It may, it may be a limited edition run, perhaps. That may swing it your way. So, um, You've got to look at value as well, to a degree. Now, I've seen some very nice looking watches that when I look at the spec, turns out it's quartz. Now, that is not a problem in and of itself. But personally, I like mechanical watches. So if it's a quartz, I usually discount it at that point. But 
saying that, I do have a Casio Duro and it was the looks and the price that sealed the deal there. It's a super watch for around 60 quid. So that was a bit of a no brainer really. Now I was gonna say that the next criteria is desirability. Certainly some of the pieces I have in my collection fall under that process. Then I have homages that are under a hundred pounds and I can't say that they were chosen with desirability in mind. But that leads me into yet another question, this time from Boombia, Boombaya123. Thanks fellow, by the way, and thanks Boombia. Do you have any watch collecting regrets? Well, going back to the criteria for choosing a watch, one thing I've learned with the benefit of hindsight is, if you see a watch that you want, print a photo of it, stick it on the fridge door. Now, if you find yourself still looking at and drooling over that picture after a week or so of fridge raiding, then it's quite possibly a watch that you, that you really want. Now, I've bought a couple of watches that with the benefit of hindsight, I wished I'd just waited a bit for. Now, those are the Marlow Coniston Speed Edition, which I think I've worn once, and Mrs. Watch Geek has worn once, just for photo opportunities. And the uh, second one is the Stratton Yacht Racer. Now, both of these are limited editions, and maybe that's why I rushed to buy them. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with either of them. They are beautifully designed and specced watches. It's just that I haven't bonded with them. And uh, I think if I'd just waited a week or two before buying, I may have sort of gone off the boil and saved myself a few quid. I don't know. But thank you very much for, uh, for those questions, guys. Next one, we're hurtling along. Lee D. Thank you, Lee. With 20 plus watches, now 30, in the collection, how do you decide which ones make it into rotation? And have you thought of consolidating to make life easier? I'm going to have to have a drink, sorry. And Omer Bonfil, thank you very much, Omer. How do you choose the watch you're going to wear? For me, it has to colour match with my clothing. Well, thanks for your questions, guys. Omer, I wish I had a wardrobe that was varied enough to do that. Um, no, what I do, as I'm sure a lot of people do, uh, I stand in front of my watch box every morning, staring blankly at it for at least 10 minutes, pondering. Hmm. It's pathetic, isn't it? Then I will slowly whittle it down and usually resort to my current favourites, which as I've said, is the Satina DS Action Diver. And my new old Doxa Sub 300 T-Graph Shark Hunter. Um, I think that's probably because it's one of my newer watches. Now, if we go out anywhere, and that's been pretty rare for most of us over the last year, it has to be said, but we are venturing out now for the odd coffee here and there, and the obvious visits to watch shops, then it's usually either my uh, my Navitimer B01 or my Hullcore Bluesy that uh, that get the wrist time there, and I'm not being snobbish at all here, guys. But I'm not really going to wear a cheaper watch out when I have the opportunity to wear one of my more higher end pieces. I I I hope you understand that. Um, and, and that's the problem with having such a varied collection, I think. Some are just not going to get worn outside the house. Ah, it's alcohol. And Lee, <coughs> and Lee, consolidating them would indeed make life simpler. Now, there are one or two that I just don't wear, but I can't bring myself at this moment to sell any of my watches. I may well do at some point, but they all 
just look so nice sitting there in the display case looking all intricate and beautiful thank you very much for those questions next one from honest watch reviews hi james uh, what equipment do you use to shoot your videos well too bloody much equipment james um, i am uh, a filmmaker and i i ran a video production company for a few years before retiring so i use a ton of equipment that's probably well over the top for what I get out of it. Now this is my studio setup at the moment. This is my forward-facing camera, my Sony A7S II with a 16 to 24 mil lens and now set up with my teleprompter which is what I'm reading from to present this to you today. My overhead camera is my Sony A6500, which I use with either a 55mm prime or a 30mm macro lens. And I have a couple of Yongnu LED lights set up one either side of me with a bit of diffusion on them just to soften the lighting. And I also connect my Atomos Shinobi monitor to my overhead so I can see if everything's in frame. I film everything in 4K which allows for some serious cropping in in post. Now 4K is four times the pixel re resolution of 1080p or HD. So you can crop in to a quarter of the screen size when editing and you still get full HD resolution if you are outputting an HD video, 1080p video. So you can afford to film a little bit wider and then punch in to get the close-ups or to just vary the viewing experience for people who are watching. As for audio, I do have wireless mics and all sorts of stuff, but I use one of these handy Zoom H1 recorders that uh, I use, uh, connect to a fairly cheap Lavalier mic and just pop it in my pocket. And I will always clap at the beginning, like a clapperboard, to provide an audible spike and a visual aid when syncing the audio and visual tracks in post. When you're sliding the tracks around, you'll see the little peak where you clap on the audio track and the video, you'll see the, and you can sync them. Why am I telling you this? You don't want to know. I then edit it all in Vegas Pro 18. Second question from James, what's the funniest slash weirdest comment you've ever had? Well, I've had a few, a few vile comments, which I think every YouTuber has at some point. Only one or two. They used to pee me off quite a bit, but um, I just laugh now. It's very easy for people to say what they like when hiding behind a computer screen. Would they say those things to your face? Well, if they did, I'd jolly well give them a bunch of fives. But as I say, it's only happened once or twice and they, they seem to have buggered off. So that's all good. And I've had a couple of people comment on Instagram, actually, as to why do I have homage watches and higher end watches? They're like really puzzled and even chastising me and calling me a rookie for daring to have both cheap and expensive watches. Now, that is snobbery at its ugliest. I have no time for that whatsoever. Just jog on. <sighs> well, we're getting there, guys. We really are. We've only got a couple of questions left now. And the next one being... Thanks, James, for those, by the way. The next one is from Nick Likes Watches. Hi, Nick. When you have several high-end pieces, what is it about the cheaper stuff that still makes you wear them and get excited about them? Well, thanks for that, Nick. I think it's just a case of I really like watches. Doesn't have to be an expensive watch for me to like a watch. And as I said previously, there are a few that I don't really wear so much anymore, but every purchase I've made has been a part of my watch collecting journey. And your question has indeed prompted me to actually start wearing some of my affordable watches again. Hence my steel dive homage. And um, it's like I'm wearing them for the first time all over again. 
and I've, I've, I've enjoyed that actually and uh, I think it might um, sort of lead me to to decide if there are any watches I really aren't feeling anything for those might be the ones that go um, it is becoming harder though to be in love with a sub 100 pound watch when I'm so fortunate to have a few grail pieces and uh, I also think that our watch buying and collecting evolves over time and we learn from owning certain watches what direction we'll be heading for going forward so thanks very much for that next question from worth a watch if you could go back and start your watch collection all over again would you pull all your hard-earned or mrs watch geeks hard-earned into one or two pieces or stay with a good size collection and variety well mate i have a huge problem with money in that i don't seem to be able to keep hold of it the collecting bug has well and truly bitten me so yes as i've said there are a few that i don't really wear that much now but i did most of them anyway wear them at the time and i enjoyed them and i don't think i'm cut out for being a three watch collection kind of guy and um, there is an ever growing list of watches i'd go out and buy tomorrow if the funds allowed as i'm sure we all would and that leads on to the final question from time for another watch and oh, i love that name time for another watch it's always time for another watch i love it and the question is you already have an amazing collection well thank you so much kind sir but do you still have a grail watch well grail watch now the term holy grail should really mean something that is practically impossible to find it may be out there but no one knows where it is or if it even exists Ooh. but in watch collecting terms however it usually just refers to an expensive watch now for those on tighter budgets their grail may be something that only costs 500 pounds to a thousand pounds and for someone with unlimited spondulies it may mean spending 17.75 million dollars on Paul Newman's personal Daytona which as you probably know happened in 2017 nearly 18 million pounds for a watch Ooh. for me though I'd love an Amiga Planet Ocean any other Rolex and then Breitling only the other day released their new Super Chronomat 44s and this one with the UTC module made me ever so slightly wet myself at £8,000 though for this one this is what I am going to try and force myself to actually save up for which is probably going to take either a very very long time or it's not going to happen so there we go guys thank you all so much for your questions and i hope that this has been ever so slightly entertaining and informative now as usual thanks to all of you who've liked and subscribed to the channel and uh, please do if you haven't and thanks again to everyone who has asked uh, a question i am really really grateful if you have any more questions at all please drop them below i do reply to all of them the nice ones anyway now my next video will be a review which will be coming very soon so until next time watch fans take care stay safe and i'll see you soon yes done done as a done thing that's done on a very done day